On the 24th of February 1918, the Salvation Committee publicly declared the small Baltic nation of Estonia an independent and democratic republic. From then until Soviet occupation in 1940, the 24th of February has been observed as the day of independence and a national holiday. Now, this year in 2022, it will mark 104 years since Estonia declared statehood. And while there is an impressive lineup of events, including the military parade, concerts, flag hoisting, uh, feasting, and general merrymaking, this episode on Thailand Talks will take a walk down memory lane to explore how Estonians continued to hold this day dear, even through decades of Soviet occupation. Now, we'll also delve into the impact this might have had on patriotism and overall feelings towards their country. Then, and now. Now, to help us delve into this is Indrek Tarend, who is a former member of the European Parliament as well as the European Green Party. Now, Tarend has served as an advisor to the Prime Minister of Estonia and also as the Secretary General of the Estonian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Our second guest is Alexander Metzimat. He's an art historian and curator who has worked both in the Art Museum and the Estonian Museum. Museum of History. Now, currently, he's mostly occupied with writing, arts, critique, and finishing his MA in the Estonia Academy of Arts. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us today. Thank you. Okay. So we're, we're, we're going to look at this as a little bit of like a, a history lesson, but like not too heavy, um, even though it's kind of going to go in that area. Okay. From the 1940s, till about the early 1990s, Estonia was occupied by a foreign power. I mean, this is, everyone knows this. Now, how did Estonians find a way to still observe their independence? Or, or did they even do If you allow me, I would uh, make it a very easy and simple history. Uh, Go ahead, this line. is why we're here. <laughs> Estonia mm -hmm. uh, is a unique country because in 20th century, such a small nation mm -hmm. managed to become independent twice. And the first time was obviously even more heroic, I would say, because, you know, we had a war with most powerful powers in Europe, Germany and Russia, and we won. Germany has tried twice to win a war on two fronts, never succeeded. Yeah. We did. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, of course, uh, the memories of the first period of independence were quite vivid. Mm. And uh, most of the people, I think, uh, didn't allow the Soviet authorities to erase completely the knowledge about uh, real history. However, the efforts to to, to, to force population to think differently and uh, adopt uh, the Soviet narrative mm. were also enormous. They had lots of resources, mm. all sorts of party secretaries and political detail. So, in a way, in 1980s, we gradually became to be very much afraid of that if that Soviet occupation continues, we may not survive. Mm. But finally, the time was ripe. <laughs> the time was ripe oh, yeah. indeed. How? It, let's talk about, you, you, you did mention, and I think it, it, everyone would agree that indeed Estonia is a unique country. How, would, how do you think they, the people managed to just keep that together? And like you were mentioning about the erasure, how do you... In such a situation, how, what, what are the kinds of things that you would have to do to ensure that you're still holding on to your history, you're still holding on to the culture, you're still holding on to the teachings from you know, your forefathers in order right. not to disappear? Well, for instance, not all the books, mm. they're burned by the Soviets because they did the same thing. They burned the books they mm. didn't like. But almost every family, or at least every second family, mm had something at grandmother's or grandfather's uh, attic, so you could read, for instance, the very same history of the uh, War of Independence. Mm -hmm. Or you could 
have uh, pre-war newspapers or uh, school textbooks. And so basically you had some uh, reading data. And uh, the fun part of that was that huge part of Estonian literature even was banned by the Soviets mm. because the authors were not so much liked. Yeah. And so the interesting activity was to copy those illegal books, to share them with friends, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, being aware that maybe the special services are paying attention to your activities, it made it even more fun, <laughs> so to say. danger. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the other side, of course, was that um, we learned to treat the Soviet authority and the collaboration the collaboration with the Soviet authorities, to treat it with some kind of, through some kind of irony prism or with a special type of black humor. Mm. So that helped, I think. I see. Now you keep saying we, are you saying we as in an Estonian, yeah. for your own personal No, experience? no, no, we as a, as, a, as, a pe as people, as a country. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, we, I mean, it wasn't like, um, uh, I want to underline here that on the surface, yeah, we had 50,000 Estonians as members of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Mm. 50,000. Okay. But still, most of us were not. And uh, even though it was difficult to, to speak about things, or impossible even, to, to, to speak about things as we were and, and about our rights or so on, but... Uh, it was honorable still to do it, so to say. It's a kind of resistance or mm. something like that. Uh, and we still actually have these impulses coming from the Soviet period because sometimes we get very angry on each other. Mm. Hey, you have no right to say that because you were a leader of a communist organization. Mm. So uh, that still affects us. Okay, now let's talk about, if you, if you can, um, Alexander, if you can um, comment on this. Let's talk about how you would, this, this situation would have impacted the way Estonians would have felt about themselves. Would it have had, would it have promoted like a, a sense of pride and, you know, holding on or would it have dampened their spirit? Well, I think that uh, Estonian identity has always been a really cultural thing okay. because, you know, if you'd really like to trace your independence back to its, you know, deep, deep roots, you'd end up at the year 1810 when serfdom was ended and when you, you know, first got an opportunity to move, actually, you know, live and make your own life mm. in many respects. Mm. And from that point on, actually, a really important thing for Estonians to define, you know, mm. was what is our culture. Uh, from, you know, 1840s when we started our first, uh, you know, studied Estonian uh, communities up until the 1870s when we first started, you know, getting Estonian students at Tartu University. Uh, getting them to, you know, build their own cultural identity. For example, in 1870s, when they first started to, you know, read the Estonian national epic compiled in the yeah. 1850s, we didn't even have enough uh, words in our own language to, you know, have an educated conversation as we're having right now. Uh, so our culture was, you know, built, you know, brick by brick, person by person. And I think that uh, because of that, you know, uh, Sovietization uh, during the occupation didn't have, you know, that much effect as you might even imagine on the people uh, because you know building our culture in you know communities in organizations you know tightening it uh, families or friendships was something that we you know already had an experience in mm. uh, for a whole century even mm. uh, so you know memories were well kept for example yeah, sure. uh, uh, my grandfather during the soviet times you know always hid his flag in the attic only brought it out, you know, from my mother's side, and they brought it out during the 24th. My grandmother was always really, really worried, you know, oh my God, oh my God, what could happen now? Uh, and uh, you know, my mother doesn't, says that she doesn't remember what was talked about, but even, you know, speeches were given and everything was really, uh, celebratory is maybe the wrong word, but even, you know, religious kind of. Religious yeah, is also yeah, but religion mm -hmm. is another aspect. We yeah, are actually aspect. the last pagan mm. country. In, in, in no, but this you're quite pride. proud of that title. <laughs> I am. Yeah, some others are not. But, <laughs> but civic pride, maybe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which wasn't really like uh, lost during the occupation mm. in that sense. Exactly. And uh, fun fact: the same flag can be right now actually be seen in the Estonian History Museum 
if you go inside the exposition and go into the second hall, I think, it was the same one used uh, during the first uh, announcement of the first Estonian Republic. Yeah. Uh, ah, at, interesting. Uh, yes, Estonian Republic was actually first announced uh, 1918, mm -hmm. uh, 23rd of December, actually, yeah. at Pärnu and La Theatre, because as you before said, Estonia was you know, always caught between two ferns. Mm -hmm. There was the Germans and there were you know, Russians on the other yeah. side. And actually our independence was uh, uh, you know, juristic prudently, I think I'm mis, uh, mis saying it in English, but juristically announced because we had this short, of a short time window, mm. you know, during the time before, you know, Russians came in, but when the Germans were leaving. Mm. And Estonian intelligentsia and uh, national fathers, you know, actually used the opportunity to, you know, celebrate it with a flag. And yeah, we were, we were ready. Okay. In many ways, mm -hmm. to accomplish the establishing of an independent republic, mm. democratic republic. And also in 91, strangely, again the elites at least, but also broader uh, folks, were ready to shrug off the Soviet in, uh, occupation and create something which we had missed for half a century. So, yeah, we were lucky. Wow. You call it luck. But speaking about flags, if, well, you, if you allow yeah. me. Well, I was actually, actually going to go there. <laughs> actually, again, another unique fun fact is that, um, okay, many people believe in the legend. They know the person who uh, made the first uh, American flag. Mm -hmm. And we know the legends that the Hungarian oh, king... Well. <laughs> Hungarian king got mm -hmm. it from the god itself, himself, and the Danish flag mm -hmm. came down here in Tallinn, uh, and then the, the Danish troops won ours. But uh, so basically, we have given birth to three flags the Danish one, then our own, mm -hmm. blue, black, and white, and of course, the Latvian students who were studying also in Tartu University. They said, okay, Estonian students are having flag. We need to have a flag. <laughs> I see, so, basically, so that inspired the Latvian flag yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, basically, we can claim that we have a home of three different uh, flags. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, but he mentioned the original blue, black and white. Of course, the Soviets wanted to destroy it all, and they managed. But on the other hand, many, many people, numerous, I would say, like his grandfather or somebody else's grandfather or mother, the flags were hidden. Yeah. And uh, it was technically punished. It was a crime under the Soviet regime. I see. But of course people, I commit this crime because <laughs> it's a valuable thing to do because it shows I'm not giving up the hope. Okay. And in my family, the story was a little bit different. We couldn't bring a blue, black and white flag on 24th mm. of February or on any other day. Because my great grandfather, who worked in uh, Minister of Interior, mm -hmm. and he was in charge every day to raise the blue, black, and white flag on the big Hermann Tower every morning with a sunset rise, every evening with a sunset. And in 1940, of course, they were kicked out. And uh, but he had these used flags of tall Hermann. In their living. And so basically after the war under Stalin, the, the life was really miserable, poor. They were sent to Siberia. Mm. So my, his sister okay. made the school clothing for my aunt and and the flag. from the flag. And they were doing it with, so, I mean, but she needs clothing to go to school. So what do we do? We cut it and few aprons and things like that. Fabric. So I didn't have my own personal blue, black and white during the Soviet times, but uh, I knew people who had. <laughs> that is definitely, wow, that's a, a captivating story. Uh, with the Estonian flag, what does it represent in terms of black, blue and white? What, what is it? He's art historian. He should have <laughs> So let's talk to the art historian. <laughs> well, uh, the Estonian flag, uh, you know, was given birth to by the Estonian Student Society. Okay. So it didn't actually, you know, take birth as a, you know, a national flag, mm -hmm. uh, but as a flag for, you know, Estonian, you know, young intelligentsia who wanted to cultural aspirations, cultural aspirations mm -hmm. who wanted to, you know, be as a society, uh, be together, have our own culture, and actually uh, the flags, you know, three colors have a 
quite a simple meaning. Uh, the blue representing uh, the, the blue sky. Oh, uh, okay. you know, so the sky. Uh, our aspirations, you know, uh, educationally, culturally. The future. The future. Uh -huh. uh, the black is, uh, you know, as a representation of our black past, as a representation mm -hmm. of our heritage from, you know, the countryside. Slavery, Slavery. all sorts well, of bad things. 1810s, you know, people who started, you know, to work out of the concept of the flag in the 1880s, you know, their grandfathers and grandmothers basically were, you know, serfs or, you know, okay. slaves in common parlance, basically. Mm. And uh, the white represents the hope for a better future. And uh, I remember actually... Some would argue it's Nordic. Snowy. <laughs> Snow. There's well, a debate still it would, going It would on. make sense. But I mean, we needed we this, have a lot of snow. We need, the students <laughs> needed this flag mm. because the German student organizations had, had them. flag. And the, the, the main was, we are not any kind of worse kind of people. We want to be equal with them. Yeah. And that, in order to become equal, okay, we must have lots of scientific cultural achievements, but also we need to have the same insignia like they do. Assemble. And this is how it sort of came. And then... Because of this cultural revolution, I would even say, and success of that, the flag was become to symbolize the whole nation. Mm. But finally, of course, in the War of Independence, it served as a real um, banner. Yeah, motivation. Yeah. yeah, and then after that, it was uh, uh, decreed by the parliament that this is going to be our state uh, flag. The original, the first one is in Tartu. Okay. 150 something years. 50. Same few. colors or? Yeah, same color. Okay, the colors, because the story is in interesting. In 1940, they had to hide it. Mm. And they put it into the, there was a, a house in construction and the chimney was going to be built and they put it into the foundation of this chimney and it survived there all the Soviet occupation. It was a top secret, only four guys from the society knew it. Two of them were in Canada and two of them here. So, uh, and it was kind of um, like a relic. Yeah, relic. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, and it had to be, of course, treated after being in this uh, ground, but it was done and it's still uh, in the exposition. It's one of the, um, let's say, sacred, one of the few sacred things we <laughs> keep from this country. Okay. It was actually really cute during the 20s, you know, after the independence was actually announced. And, uh, you know, right now you can go to Wikipedia, find the exact blue color that you have to have, the exact mm -hmm. black and so on. Uh, but during the first Estonian Republic uh, in the 1920s, you know, people actually didn't have the right kind of blue. So there yeah. are actually, you know, different shades of different blue. Different shades of yeah. blue, you know, everybody wanted to have a national flag, but we didn't yeah. have... Finally, one Estonian immigrant so was so mm -hmm. stubborn, yeah. she, he demanded the United Nations to define the Estonian blue in mm. terms of physics, in the, the okay. length of the wave. Mm -hmm. But it brings me to the year of uh, 1988. Okay. I was then a student, and uh, we decided that um, we will use blue, black and white colors separately because we didn't dare to put them together as a flag, but we thought mm -hmm. that maybe we trick the Soviet authorities <laughs> by using them separately. Yeah. And of course the material, the only material which under Perestroika was available were the sheets of a bed. Bed sheets, yeah. Bed sheets. Okay, white, clear. Black, also easy. Mm -hmm. Have a black color and you turn it into a black. But then the, the blue, blue, yeah, complicated. But a friend of mine, his wife came in and said, I have a, a skirt, exactly, you know, basically. Like this. So she did And her she basically, skirt. no hesitation. <laughs> and a flag it came. All right, the skirt that became a flag. <laughs> And then the flag that became a school uniform. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, there, there, <laughs> there is a bit of a connection there. Now, let's um, come a bit more forward and then let's talk about independence as in what it, it, it represents in terms of the two sides. I mean, Soviet occupation, obviously, there were Russians who lived here. This became their home. This is still their home for, a, 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 like, about 30% of, of the population. And... How was, 
was there an issue with regards to celebrating or marking this day and was was there any friction? How did that feel? Well, the end of the Soviet Union mm. for many millions of Russians mm. came as a bad surprise. Okay. They were not prepared okay. to lose their one-sixth of their territory of mm. the planet and uh, so on and so on. And of course, in their interpretation, even if they are not believers of the communist ideas, Soviet Union was a force of good. Yeah, and now it collapses. Them. Yeah, and we have some kind of. I mean, they didn't say it often openly, but basically they treated us as a, some kind of Nazi, whatever resurrection, and uh, the relations were very, very tense. In when you say tense, give, give us like some examples of, of, of how tense it was. I mean, it was very tense. Not that tense like in Ukrainian mm -hmm. TV right now. Okay. We didn't fight because public fight never occurred. Okay. And also we were lucky because people died in, in, in Latvia and in Lithuania in 91. But uh, we, we were... It happened that we didn't have to lose any human life in this. But basically, yeah, there was no common ground actually to be found. Because the, even the, there was a certain kind of self-inflicted segregation. Mm -hmm. Segregation, that, yes. That, that Russians worked in factories mm -hmm. and in Estonians slowly but steadily moved away to work in other places. So basically, there was no was normal no interaction no under the Soviet. Okay. And suddenly, okay, here we are. What shall we do? And this is why we had um, problems in the region of northeastern Estonia, yeah. where they basically even aspired for certain kind of autonomy or yeah. se se so separation. Narva, Narva yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just was there yesterday, so <laughs> okay. I remember that uh, period quite well. And of course, there was. I mean, when I was in the Soviet army, I was forced to speak in Russian, yeah? Mm -hmm. And the Russification was also a sort of policy in, in, in Soviet times. Under Brezhnev, they introduced more and more Russian at schools and at the universities, and they forced our scientists to write their theses in Russian, not in Estonian, so on and so on. On the other hand, the Russians who had moved here, they were never seriously forced to learn Estonian. And uh, I mean, in a, it was standard practice. If I wanted to speak Estonian to my friend, for mm -hmm. it, well, no, no, it's not allowed. You speak in Russian. human language. Which was Russian. Uh, yeah. yeah, which was Russian. Uh, officially, it was called the language of international friendship. The yeah. language of international friendship. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that was... Uh, instead of lingua franca. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, I must give credit also to those people who were forced or voluntarily came to live here under the Soviets. They kept some limits. And mm. I mean, of course, we were arguing about whether Western should be independent or not. Mm -hmm and under which conditions, what kind of rights should be the Soviet people given, but we were insisting on the legal continuity. So we had this kind of citizenship problems and uh, okay. which were politically very heated. But they also behaved. They never came out like just bashing their opponent or something like that. So there's even a story or sort of not so scientific explanation that uh, uh, they say that the, the, the Baltic Russians mm -hmm. in Latvia and Estonia are somewhat different from the Russian Russians. Okay. They, Is it because of the dilution of culture? It, yeah, because of interaction of different culture. Okay. Yeah, you were saying Alexander? Uh, sorry, even they themselves see them, you know, quite differently, I'd say. Mm. Because, well, you know, how you were speaking, you know, the Estonians and Russians lived separately during the Soviet times, so on, so on. The segregation continued, but, you know, we still live in the same city, we still exactly. go to the same yeah. schools, so on and so on. And for example, when yeah, you had your experience at the Russian army, when you, know, you were supposed to speak Russian and uh, you know, a common tongue and so on, 
And actually, I, me myself, I'd say that you know, Estonian Army right now is one of the best integration projects I've seen right. you know, in the entirety of Europe. Because I've served with you know, you know, guys whose uh, mother tongue is Russian, uh, who themselves you know, speak Russian way better than they ever spoke Estonian, but who say that, you know, come on, what are you even saying? This is my home country. You know, of course I will fight for it. So I think that you know, the dialectic between you know, Russians, them, and Estonians, us, has you know, really become it's something changing. more fictitious, fictitious yeah, yeah, yeah. during it's the changing. last So those years. lines are blurring. Those but it's also, it, it it's also blurred, I'd say. the collapse of the Soviet Union yeah. gives Estonians also the opportunity to behave better. While freeing us from the obligation to be against uh, and fight for your life, mm. so we can be quite reasonable okay. in understanding the worries and concerns mm -hmm. of other people. And I, I mean, we are not speaking only about Russians because uh, the Soviet uh, legacy contains Ukrainians, Belarusians, Armenians, you name them. So basically, we picked one of the great values of 1920s, which is the law of cultural autonomy. And it is applied and everybody is, is uh, free in legal terms to pursue its cultural development and interests. So uh, in a way, I would give credit also to Estonians. We didn't behave badly as well because, I mean, I myself, and I could say, hey, you killed my that relative, mm. you deported that relative, you forced my family to flee, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so like yeah, a, I want a revenge. retaliation. Yeah, I need a retaliation, but we didn't ask for that. So I think our is it, leaders... Is it the general that. sentiment or more of like the majority of the sentiment was that, you know, people did not want to retaliate? It was controlled. That way. It was controlled. It was controlled. They felt it. By the, One thing was, yeah. it was controlled, but the second thing was that, you know, a lot of Russians actually came to here, you know, came here to work. Okay. Or, you know, they got, you know, jobs here. They didn't come here as, you know... Uh, let's go on a cultural mission to Estonia, but they came here because, oh, I got an apartment here. I moved to here with my family and so on. Yeah, mm -hmm. but so in the aftermath of the Second World War, you have to calculate in that tens of thousands of Estonians mm -hmm. were deported. Ported as well. So that's how you get free living space. True, so because if it's empty then. <laughs> yeah, so basically these kind of feelings also were vivid or alive, but the Estonian leaders of, the, of this period, I think they're very reasonable and smart and also polite. And they somehow found this formula. Mm. Um, speaking about international sort of situation, of course, uh, Boris Yeltsin as a president of Russia mm -hmm. had an impact on the community. But I like to bring this comparison. Then uh, France, out of all countries, gave up its powers in Algeria. Okay. So people in France sort of accepted that, yeah, this is the tide of history, which this yeah, should let, happen. Let go of we, your territories we, yeah. and whatnot. But the French people living in Algeria, the most bitterly opposed mm -hmm. in their majority. And uh, in 90s, we had this similar sort of effect here. Yes. But people in Moscow, or in particular St. Petersburg, yeah, okay. Relax, we are never going to attack you or yeah. leave your race. But here, the spirit was, hey, we want the Soviet Union back. I mean, here in Estonia still, those who have Russian passports, okay. they vote for Mr. Putin in higher percentages than Putin ever gets in his own district. Mm. So, so what do you think, what, what, what do you think would contribute to this? Is it that um, maybe those in that position, would, you, you would say that they are in a, a position of benefiting from that situation and so would oppose it? Or I think it's a sort of imperialist nostalgia. Okay. It's, uh, because like they regard Putin as... The grass always seems uh, greener from, you know, outside, so to speak. Ah. Okay, right, let's, uh, we, I mean, we did say that it was going to be slightly heavy, still <laughs> informative. Just too heavy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, still informative, um, but now let's make it slightly lighter. Um, in the independence celebration, I'm a, an expat, I'm from Ghana, I've been in Tallinn for two years, other people have been here for a longer time, we have a huge um, expat population, <laughs> um, people love Estonia for a lot of reasons, and valid reasons, and... We would like to, would celebrate, like to celebrate with you. 
Okay. What do we do? Tell us, how can Please. we support you? My first suggestion is, Okay. again, we are unique in many ways, mm -hmm. but we are also unique in our stubborn stupidity. And <laughs> okay. we, we uh, invented the tradition that on 24th of February, on the day of independence, we start with the rising of a flag. Yes. And by the law, it needs to be raised when the sun comes up. Mm -hmm. So it's 7.30. Yeah, 7.30. So basically, and it's cold, and it's windy. <laughs> and and so we still, people, it's not a sort of combustion. People want to come here. There are two songs, two short speeches, and the flag goes up. And uh, I've been there almost every year. Nice. And I always know... A lot of uh, foreign? foreigners coming there. Okay, it started with a, with a diplomatic corps. It was a torture for them, but they had to, do, they had to wake up early and come there. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are more and more foreigners who join us. Uh, we really appreciate it. But look, you respect us because even in our stupidity. <laughs> but if you're an expat, then a thing to do if you have an Estonian, you know, person who you know, like, at least a bit, mm -hmm. you should ask if you like, Hey, can I maybe come to your family and just be together at the table and yeah. so on? Because, you know, that's the real Estonian experience. But which is what I was going to come to. If I do come to go to my Estonian best friend's house um, with, to spend time with her family, what would I have to expect by way of, say, a traditional Estonian drink or a traditional Estonian meal or something that is more like uh, is that, that you eat or drink on Independence Day that you'd say is unique to Estonia? Is if, there something like that? If yeah. you're a vegetarian, it's going to be really difficult. You know, we, <laughs> okay. and we have it, Thankfully, uh, I'm not, mm -hmm. but there are other people who are, yeah. might be vegetarian and vegan. We are not necessarily famous for our cuisine, but, <laughs> but definitely I something... Didn't, I didn't say that. Some kind of food <laughs> is available. Okay. And I don't know why, but it is, appears that the, the heat of the day is, uh, you know, this small fish like a Baltic anchovies or something like that. It's kilo in Estonia. Oh. Okay, the tiny yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so basically you have a uh, bread covered with that with a uh, bread bit, okay you have a black bread black bread yeah so black bread covered with tiny fish yeah some okay. egg perhaps An and egg. then a independent boiled or fried egg boiled boiled okay. egg black bread mm. fish so it's like a mm. small thing I like this and then you you probably get treated with a honorary shot to independence. Uh, what, what would this shot be? A vodka? Oh, it can be, vodka. Yeah, or it can okay. be homemade even sometimes. Homemade? You know, Actually, it's a tradition. <laughs> okay. What is really cool, uh, I've always said that Estonia has this sort of a small plates culture. Yeah. Very inoffensiveness. We have a lot of small plates with you know, stuff on it. And you know, one thing is you know, rye bread and you know, this classic small fish and, you know, and a, a hunk of pig. Something along those lines. But what is really excellent or really you know, sweet, if you can notice this, are the pickled things. Because, you know, you pickle things yeah. for a whole year. Pickle your, I don't know, anything from pickles to tomatoes to these sorts of, you know, paradise apples. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you're in a homely setting, then this is sort of a really sweet thing to see. Mm -hmm. How, you know, these self-made things are bought out every year during the winter yeah. when you have absolutely nothing around except for snow and really bad weather. So I think that might be a thing to appreciate, even as a vegan. Yeah, mostly. and perhaps you even don't get enough food on that occasion. Okay. But you should be prepared that perhaps in the company normally somebody is a, like a first singer, so you could sing some sometimes patriotic songs, sometimes fun songs together, and probably the stories will be told. We are mm. still stories like happen. children. We like fairy tales and stories. <laughs> You're talking about patriotic songs. What, 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 give us, give, I mean, you don't have to be an amazing singer. Just give us an idea of, is it like the, the anthem? Yeah, well, anthem is a sort of official one. Yeah. But there are a number of, uh, like the flag song, for instance. It's, There's it's, a flag song? Yeah, yeah, it's about blue, black, and white as a, the colors of a, Go on. <laughs> and there are many of them. Really? There are actually, yeah. There's a song, the Estonian flag, there's a... My uh, fatherland, my love. Yeah, no, this is the Kaunis Tage, Mestiko, yeah. There are a number of, some of them date back from the Romantic period of the 19th mm -hmm. century. Some of them uh, were created in 1980s, 1990s. And I mean, 
every, every whatever series, uh, level of series, the seriousity of a party, mm. you can have fun songs. <laughs> okay. I think if you search in YouTube for like uh, Estonian Independence Day playlist, you can probably find something that has, you know, yeah, yeah. pictures of, you know, a cold sea and then, you know, the songs coming behind it. So you're basically saying you're not going to try to sing the flag song for us? We are not prepared, not prepared. to do it right now. <laughs> We, did, it, we, we, did, we didn't take We'll, we'll do that off camera. I'm yeah, yeah, off <laughs> camera, off as camera. much as you wish. <laughs> okay. and, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but, but Def, he's right, right. The celebration, in a way, is uh, like a family or clan based mm. or something okay. like that. And it is because in the countryside, it could be also, I mean, it shouldn't be in, in the main opera theatre, right? like a reception for important people. Mm -hmm. It could be also in the local centres. and uh, okay. So it would be, people could take more direct um, connectivity to these festivities. Otherwise it becomes, there's a threat in my opinion. But it may become too serious and celebrated only, um, so to say, by, by certain ranks, which it was never meant to be. It is a whole uh, country's uh, holiday. Let's talk about, um, you know, mu uh, museums. Like, let's say, for those who might not get the opportunity to maybe go, maybe they don't have any Estonian families to spend time with. Um, they are more like, yeah, like to take photos or want to just explore Tallinn or, you know, all the, their respective cities. Um, is there anything happening with the museums, any viewings that... Well, can... if you're interested in history, then uh, yeah. two main things. Uh, right next to the Freedom Square where the parade is, mm -hmm. is a uh, Vabamo, or Freedom Museum, so yeah. to speak. Vabamo. 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 Like, uh, okay. free in Estonia is Vaba. Vaba. And museum is, well, Muse. So, uh, Vabamo, combination of yeah. Freedom, like Freedom Museum. museum. Okay. And uh, they have exhibitions and tours covering uh, mostly the last 30 years. Uh, more from a sociological angle, so to speak. Uh, but if you really want to see, you know, have a day at the museum, so to speak, and, you know, visit different things, uh, then me, myself, uh, I'd suggest visiting Estonian History Museum at uh, Marjame in Pirinka. Yeah. Marjame, yeah. yes. The former residence of Count Orlov. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. At Pirita, right? Yeah, at Pirita. Uh, I think museums are opened on 24th. Uh, the History Museum and the Vabamu both are, and both have you know, yeah. special programs running throughout the day, so you can leave your you know, kid at the children's playground and actually you know, enjoy an hour of... You know, I don't know, where, for younger people, there are all sort of uh, uh, collections and uh, activities going on. There's a photographiska here behind it. So basically there is a... Uh, definitely a choice what you could do and mm -hmm. probably I hope the museums treat you friendly. You get a really good overview of you know what has happened dates and so on mm -hmm. and uh, for culture experience uh, you know pack yourself in you know we're a big park and so on uh, but we should we should visit the open air museum okay uh, because it actually has you know Estonian architecture you know coming back from the uh, the time we all still lived at farms. Mm, mm. And you can like really get a good uh, picture of the Estonian life being, so to speak. Okay. And uh, you know, it's also a good day outside. You know, you finish there, you've been there for two or three hours and you think, oh my God. Before this Hopefully virus, virus thing know. started, <laughs> you could also have, I mean, have a good possibility to get integrated into something interesting mm -hmm. while walking in the old town. I mean, True. you could, people, on 24th of February, I think even Estonians are relatively open. friendly and uh, oh, more open. <laughs> open <yeah. laughs> so thank you so very much for joining us today. I mean, we could have this conversation for hours, but this is all time would allow. Thank you. Okay. All right. So that's basically how we wrap up today on Talent Talks. And here's what to expect on the 24th of February, Independence Day. Now, the anniversary will kick off with the ceremonial hoisting of the flag at the Tolherman Tower during sunrise. 
followed by a ceremony at 7.30 a.m. So you have to wake up. It's going to be cold, probably wet, probably slippery, but you need to be careful. But it will definitely be worth your while. Now, last year, the parade of the Defense Forces was canceled due to COVID-19. Now, this year, the parade returns and will take place at the Freedom Square or Vabo de Suvayak from 12 noon and will be received by the President of the Republic, Allah Harris. Now, the units of the United Kingdom, uh, of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the French Republic that belong to NATO, um, the NATO Estonian Battle Group, will also take part in the parade. Now, if you're interested, then you can also get the opportunity to take a closer look at the fighting equipment of the Defence Forces and, of course, Estonian allies from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. Now, remember, you can access the exhibitions area only with a valid vaccination certificate. Masks are also mandatory, so be responsible. And also, as expected, all these activities will come with some changes in traffic management in the city centre. Um, areas around the Freedom Square and several sections of roads will be closed off to the general public. Now, transport routes will be rerouted and a few hundred parking spaces will also be closed in various parts of the area. And due to the pandemic, the traditional president's reception will not take place this year. As we mentioned earlier, the president's speech and the concert performance will be held in an empty hall of the Estonian Theatre. Now, this will be telecast live on ETV. And that's how we wrap up Talent Talks here. My name is Solis Rose Corte. Thank you very much for watching.